The Communist Manifesto, Key Concepts The Communist Manifesto is a pamphlet written by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels in 1848 to serve as the platform of the Communist League. It became one of the principal programmatic statements of the European Socialist and Communist parties in the 19th and early 20th centuries. The Communist Manifesto embodies Marx and Engels' materialistic conception of history and it surveys that history from the age of feudalism down to 19th century capitalism, which was destined, they declared, to be overthrown and replaced by a workers' society. The Communists, the vanguard of the working class, constituted the section of society that would accomplish the abolition of private property and raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class. In what follows, I will briefly sketch the key concepts of this seminal work. The manifesto begins by announcing, A spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. All of the European powers have allied themselves against communism, frequently demonizing its ideas. Therefore, the communists have assembled in London and written this manifesto in order to make public their views, aims and tendencies, and to dispel the maliciously implanted misconceptions. The manifesto begins by addressing the issue of class antagonism. Marx writes, The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Throughout history, we see the oppressor and oppressed in constant opposition to each other. This fight is sometimes hidden and sometimes open. However, each time the fight ends in either a revolutionary reconstruction of society or in the class's common ruin. In earlier ages, we saw society arranged into complicated class structures. For example, in medieval times there were feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices and serfs. Modern bourgeois society sprouted from the ruins of feudal society. This society has class antagonisms as well, but it is also unique. Class antagonisms have become simplified as society increasingly splits into two rival camps, that is, bourgeoisie and proletariat. The manifesto then shows how the modern bourgeoisie is the product of several revolutions in the mode of production and of exchange. The development of the bourgeoisie began in the earliest towns, and gained momentum with the age of exploration. Feudal guilds couldn't provide for increasing markets, and the manufacturing middle class took its place. However, markets kept growing and demand kept increasing, and manufacture couldn't keep up. This led to the Industrial Revolution. Manufacture was replaced by modern industry, and the industrial middle class was replaced by industrial millionaires, the modern bourgeois. With these developments, the bourgeoisie have become powerful and have pushed medieval classes into the background. The development of the bourgeoisie as a class was accompanied by a series of political developments. With the development of modern industry and the world market, the bourgeoisie has gained exclusive political sway and the state serves solely the bourgeoisie's interests. Historically, the bourgeoisie has played a quite revolutionary role. Whenever it has gained power, it has put to an end all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has eliminated the relationships that bound people to their superiors, and now all remaining relations between men are characterized by self-interest alone. Religious fervor, chivalry and sentimentalism have all been sacrificed. Personal worth is now measured by exchange value, and the only freedom is that of free trade. Thus, exploitation that used to be veiled by religious and political illusions is now direct, brutal and blatant. The bourgeoisie has changed all occupations into wage laboring professions, even those that were previously honored, such as that of the doctor. 
Similarly, family relations have lost their veil of sentimentality and have been reduced to pure money relations. In the past, industrial classes required the conservation of old modes of production in order to survive. The bourgeoisie are unique in that they cannot continue to exist without revolutionizing the instruments of production. This implies revolutionizing the relations of production, and with it, all of the relations in society. Thus, the unique uncertainties and disturbances of the modern age have forced man to face his real condition in life and his true relations with others. On bourgeois and proletarians. Because the bourgeoisie needs a constantly expanding market, it settles and establishes connections all over the globe. Production and consumption have taken on a cosmopolitan character in every country. This is true both for materials and for intellectual production, as national sovereignty and isolationism becomes less and less possible to sustain. The bourgeoisie draws even the most barbaric nations into civilization and compels all nations to adopt its mode of production. It creates a world after its own image. All become dependent on the bourgeoisie. It has also increased political centralization. Thus, we see that the means of production and of exchange, which serve as the basis of the bourgeoisie, originated in feudal society. At a certain stage, however, the feudal relations cease to be compatible with the developing productive forces. Thus the fetters of the feudal system had to be burst asunder, and they were. Free competition replaced the old system, and the bourgeoisie rose to power. Marx then says that a similar movement is underway at the present moment. Modern bourgeois society is in the process of turning on itself. Modern productive forces are revolting against the modern conditions of production. Commercial crises, due, ironically, to overproduction, are threatening the existence of bourgeois society. Productive forces are now fettered by bourgeois society, and these crises represent this tension. Yet in attempting to remedy these crises, the bourgeoisie simply cause new and more extensive crises to emerge and diminish their ability to prevent future ones. Thus, the weapons by which the bourgeoisie overcame feudalism are now being turned on the bourgeoisie themselves. Marx believes that this type of history will not go on forever, however. The manifesto will later argue that the modern class conflict is the final class conflict. The end of this conflict will mark the end of all class relations. This section begins to suggest why this might be, positing some of the ways in which the modern era is unique. First, class antagonisms have been simplified as two opposing classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, emerge. Secondly, while exploitative relationships were previously hidden behind things like ideology, now the veil has been lifted and everything is seen in terms of self-interest. Thirdly, in order for the bourgeoisie to continue to exist, they must continually revolutionize the instruments of production. This leaves social relations in an unprecedentedly unstable state. After examining the nature and history of the bourgeoisie, the manifesto now turns to the proletariat. As the bourgeoisie developed, so did the proletariat, and it is the proletariat who will eventually destroy the bourgeoisie. The proletarians live only as long as they can find work, and they can find work only as long as their labor increases capital. They are a commodity and are vulnerable to all the fluctuations of the market. Due to the development of machines and the division of labor, the proletarian's work has lost all charm. The proletarian is simply an appendage of a machine. Furthermore, as his work becomes more repulsive, his wage only decreases. Marx describes the worker as a soldier and as a slave. 
Distinctions of age and sex are becoming less important, as all people are simply instruments of labor. Furthermore, no sooner does the worker get his wages from his exploitative boss, than he is exploited by other bourgeoisie, such as his landlord. The lower strata of the middle class, such as tradespeople, gradually sink into the proletariat. This is due to the fact that they lack sufficient capital, and the fact that technology has rendered their specialized skills no longer useful. The manifesto then describes the past history of the proletariat. As soon as this class was created it began to struggle with the bourgeoisie. This struggle originally involved the individual labor and later groups of workers, rebelling against the bourgeois that directly exploited them. These workers hoped to revive the medieval status of the worker. At this point, the workers were still disorganized, divided by geography and by competition with one another. Furthermore, when they did form unions, they were under the influence of the bourgeois and actually served to further the objectives of the bourgeoisie. However, with the modern development of industry, the proletariat increased in number and became stronger and more concentrated. Furthermore, distinctions among labors began to dissolve, as all shared equally low wages and equally unsure livelihoods. At this point, workers began to form trade unions and other associations, a process in which they are still engaged at the time of the manifesto's writing. The proletariat is further helped in its unification by the increased means of communication made possible by modern industry, allowing for the struggles to take on national character. While the organization of the proletariat into a class is continually destroyed by competition among workers, each time it rises again stronger. Furthermore, as other classes try to use the proletarians to forward political their own ends, they give them tools to fight the bourgeoisie. Marx explains that the only class today that is really revolutionary is the proletariat. All of the other classes that fight the bourgeoisie, such as the shopkeeper, are conservative, fighting to preserve their existence. Among the proletariat, however, the old society is already past preservation. Law, morality, religion, are to him so many bourgeois prejudices, behind which lurk in ambush just as many bourgeois interests. Historically, the proletariat are also unique. In the past, when a class got the upper hand, it tried to subject all of society to its own mode of appropriation. However, the proletariat lack any property of their own to retain or expand. Rather, they must destroy all ways of securing private property at all. Another unique characteristic of the proletariat is that, while past movements were started by minorities, the proletariats are a vast majority and are acting in the interest of that majority. The proletarian struggle is first and foremost a national struggle. Marx writes that he has traced the proletariat's development through a veiled civil war, up to the point of open revolution and the violent overthrow of the bourgeoisie. Until now, every society has been based on class oppression. In order for a class to be able to be oppressed, however, its slavish existence must be sustainable, held steady. In contrast, laborious in modern industrial society are continually suffering a deterioration of their status, they become poorer and poorer. The bourgeoisie are thus unfit to rule, because they cannot guarantee an existence to its slave within its slavery. Thus, with the development of modern industry, the bourgeoisie produces its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. On Proletarians and Communists The manifesto then discusses the relationship of the communists to the proletarians. 
The immediate aim of the communists is the formation of the proletariat into a class, the overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, and the conquest of political power by the proletariat. The communists' theory simply describes a historical movement underway at this very moment. This includes the abolition of private property. Marx says that communists have been reproached for desiring to abolish the right of acquiring private property through the fruits of one's labor. However, he points out, laborers do not acquire any property through their labor. Rather, the property or capital they produce serves to exploit them. This property, controlled by the bourgeoisie, represents a social, not a personal, power. Changing it into common property does not abolish property as a right, but merely changes its social character by eliminating its class character. In a communist society, then, labor will exist for the sake of the labor, not for the sake of producing bourgeois-controlled property. This goal of communism challenges bourgeois freedom, and this is why the bourgeois condemn the communist philosophy. Marx writes, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. But in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Despite what the bourgeois claim, communism doesn't keep people from appropriating the products of labor. Rather, it keeps them from subjugating others in the process of this appropriation. The manifesto then addresses some objections to communism. Many dissenters maintain that no one will work if private property is abolished. However, by this logic, bourgeois society should have been overcome with laziness long ago. In reality, it is presently the case that those who work don't acquire anything, and those who acquire things don't work. Other opponents hold that communism will destroy all intellectual products. However, this reflects a bourgeois misunderstanding. The disappearance of class culture is not the same thing as the disappearance of all culture. Marx moves to the arguments against the infamous communist proposal of abolishing the family. He says the modern family is based on capital and private gain. Thus he writes, the communists plead guilty to wanting to do away with present familial relations in that they want to stop the exploitation of children by their parents. Similarly, they do not want to altogether abolish the education of children, but simply to free it from the control of the ruling class. Marx complains that the bourgeois claptrap about family and education is particularly disgusting as industry increasingly destroys the family ties of the proletarians. Thus it renders family and education as means for the transformation of children into articles of commerce. Communists are also criticized for their desire to abolish country and nationality. Marx replies that working men have no country, and we can't take from them what they don't have. National differences and antagonisms lose significance as industrialization increasingly standardizes life. Marx then says that those charges against communism based on religion, philosophy, or ideology are not deserving of serious examination. Man's consciousness changes with the conditions of his material existence. The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. In response to the claim that there are certain universal ideas, such as that of justice, that have transcended the vicissitudes of history, Marx replies that this universality is only an apparent one, reflecting an overriding history of exploitation and class antagonism. The communist revolution is a radical rupture in traditional property relations. It should be no surprise that it accompanied by radical changes in traditional ideas. We see then that the first step in the working class revolution is to make the proletariat the ruling class. It will use its political power to seize all capital from the bourgeoisie 
and to centralize all instruments of production under the auspices of the state. Of course, in the beginning this will not be possible without despotic inroads on the rights of property and on the conditions of bourgeois production. Probable steps in the revolution will include the abolition of ownership of land, the institution of a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, the abolition of all inheritance rights, the confiscation of emigrants and rebels' property, making all people liable to labor, state centralization of credit, state centralization of communication and transportation, state appropriation of factories, the gradual combination of agriculture and manufacturing industries, the elimination of the distinctions between town and country, and the establishment of free education for children. When class distinctions have disappeared, public power will lose its political character. This is because political power is nothing more than the organized power of one class for oppressing another. When the proletariat eliminate the old conditions for production, they will render class antagonism impossible and thereby eliminate their own class supremacy. Bourgeois society will be replaced by an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Socialist and Communist Literature In this section, Marx presents and critiques three subsets of socialist and communist literature. The first subset is reactionary socialism. Reactionary socialists include the feudal socialists, the petty bourgeois socialists, and the German, or true socialists. All of these groups fight against the rise of the bourgeoisie and modern industry, without realizing the historical process the bourgeoisie represent. Feudal socialists were French and English aristocrats, who wrote against modern bourgeois society. However, their chief complaint about the bourgeois was that it creates a revolutionary proletariat that will uproot the old order of society. Thus, they objected to the bourgeoisie because they were a threat to their way of life. The petty bourgeois socialists were a class that saw it would eventually lose its separate status and become part of the proletariat. Marx concedes that the petty bourgeois publications successfully showed the contradictions of the conditions of modern production. However, their suggested alternatives to this contradictory system were either to restore the old means of production and exchange, or to push the modern means of production and exchange into the framework of old property relations. Thus, this socialism is reactionary and utopian and can't accept the facts of history. Third, there is German, or true socialism. These German thinkers adopted some French socialist and communist ideas, without realizing that Germany did not share the same social conditions as France. As contemplated by the German thinkers, the French ideas lost all practical significance and were emasculated. These socialists supported the aristocracy and feudal institutions against the rising bourgeoisie, forgetting that the rise of the bourgeoisie is a necessary historical step. The true socialists support the interests of the petty bourgeoisie and thus support the status quo. They even reject class struggles. Marx claims that almost all of the so-called communist and socialist literature in Germany at this time are in fact of this character. The second subset of socialism is conservative, or bourgeois, socialism. This subset reflects the desires of a segment of the bourgeois to redress social grievances in order to guarantee the continued existence of bourgeois society. Followers of this idea include economists, philanthropists, humanitarians, improvers of the condition of the working class, organizers of charity, members of societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, temperance fanatics, and whole and corner reformers of every kind. They want the advantages of the social conditions generated by modern industry, without the struggles and dangers that necessarily accompany them. They wish for a bourgeoisie without a proletariat. 
These bourgeoisie believe that the best society is the society in which they have power. They want the proletariat to keep its weak role, but to stop hating the dominant bourgeoisie. A second form of this kind of socialism recognizes the fact that only changes in economic relations could help the proletariat. However, the upholders of this kind of socialism do not accept that such changes necessarily entail a destruction of the relations of production. Rather, they wish to make administrative reforms, which simply decrease the cost and amount of administrative work for the bourgeois government. The third subset is critical utopian socialism and communism. This subset originated with the first attempts of the proletariat to achieve their own ends. The attempts were reactionary, and the proletariat had not yet reached the maturity and economic conditions necessary for emancipation. These socialists therefore looked for new social laws to create the material conditions necessary to free the proletariat. Their writings are important because they attacked every principle of existing society and are thus useful for enlightening the working class. However, they are of a utopian character, although their vision did reflect authentic proletariat yearnings to reconstruct society, it was ultimately a fantastic vision, providing no basis for practical action. Thus, the critical utopian socialists become less significant as the modern class struggle takes shape. Lacking practical significance, their fantastic attacks lose theoretical justification. Thus, while the founders were in many ways revolutionaries, their followers are mere reactionaries. They oppose political action by the proletariat. Position of the communists in relation to the various existing opposition. The manifesto concludes with a discussion about the role of the communists as they work with other parties. The communists fight for the immediate aims of workers, but always in the context of the entire communist movement. Thus, they work with those political parties that will forward the ends of communism, even if it involves working with the bourgeoisie. However, they never stop trying to instill in the working class a recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat, and to help them gain the weapons to eventually overthrow the bourgeoisie. Thus, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by forcibly overthrowing all existing social conditions. The manifesto ends with this rallying cry. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries, unite.